In this video will discuss the spiral arms of the Milky Way galaxy and how they are traced out and how these arms survive for long periods of time. So we might wonder at all why this galaxy would have spiral arms. Why isn't it just a sphere? Why isn't it uh, smoothed out gas uh, like a pancake with filled in dough everywhere? And what's happening at the center of our galaxy will be covered in a, uh, another video not this particular video. But we have some examples of spiral galaxies. Our neighbor, the Andromeda galaxy, a few million light years away, but a neighbor nonetheless, uh, bigger than the Milky Way galaxy, but uh, showing evidence of the dust and uh, evidence of where the gas is more concentrated, the dust is more concentrated. We have these spiral arms. Another example here, M101, Messier catalog number 101, the pinwheel galaxy, and showing very nice spiral arms. Dust lanes seen in those spiral arms as this dust blocks, blocks the more distant light. And we have uh, some little reddish areas from place to place in here, the H2 regions where uh, uh, new stars are, are being born. Our map of the Milky Way is accomplished by the 21 centimeter radio information and we can see these concentrations of cold hydrogen gas forming our spiral arms. We don't get the best picture with this because we're not outside the Milky Way looking down, but we do have definite concentrations of, uh, of hydrogen gas forming spiral arms. Here's a drawing that would show the spiral arms, the bar structure of the nucleus of our galaxy, but uh, spiral arms and from the Sun, if we look in a particular direction, we see a certain constellation and we the astronomers have named some of the arms of our galaxy with those constellation names uh, where we see them but uh, that's what we have so what is the what's going on here the spiral arms we we have some problems to overcome to explain why these arms exist at all so when we look at the spiral arms we see there's a, some data points here we see more density higher density for stars, gas, and dust. When we look in between the spiral arms of the galaxy, there's a lower density. There are fewer particles per cubic centimeter. Another difference is that in the spiral arms, we tend to see young stars, very young stars. And the older stars are in between the arms, the spiral arms. So we have what are called spiral arm tracers. Um, uh, objects that allow astronomers to quickly identify where the spiral arms are located. Those would be the very young massive stars, the O and the B type stars. Um, we also see H2 regions and other galaxies that make it easy to identify where the spiral arms are. Of course those H2 regions, again we have O and B stars in the middle of the gas and the ultraviolet light from those hot stars is ionizing the gas as the electrons recombine with the protons. Uh, one color that is given off in the visible spectrum is red. So these H2 regions uh, glow bright red. Well, differential e rotation has been uh, covered in another video, but the principle here is that material that's closer to the center of the galaxy takes less time for one orbit. So in a certain amount of time, uh, star everybody, all these uh, motions are starting at the same place on the uh, uh, line here. So that's time equals zero. And the arrows show equal time of motion for all three stars. Let's say it's a star. It could be gas, could be dust, but let's say it's a star. So star one, star two, star three. Star one covers more of its orbit in this set period of time. Star two a little bit less, star one a little bit less. This is differential rotation, the differential rotation. And if we had an existing structure, let's say a straight line of gas and dust, there is none, but if we did have gas and dust in a straight line going out from the nucleus, would this straight line survive for a long period of time? Would it continue to be straight? And the answer is no. This inner part's going to get wrapped over to here and then this part gets wrapped over here and then this part moves out a little bit. So there we would get kind of a spiral uh, structure. But too much of a good thing. The differential rotation is going to continue and this material is going to wrap around and lap 
the other outer um, material, the stars and gas and dust, and it's going to destroy a distinct spiral arm. We should have a, a wrapping around of the material. So this differential rotation would destroy an existing spiral arm structure. Well, what else could be happening? Well, I, one of the data items was that the spiral arms show greater density. There's more material in the arms uh, than in between. So if you would consider this material here moving around and running into an existing concentration of gas and dust, what would happen? Well, this would slow down. This material would pile into the existing gas and dust in here, and it would slow down. And as it piles in, what's it going to do to the, the clouds, the gas clouds that are here? As we get this pressing in of material catching up with the existing gas cloud, it's going to compress it, and it's going to cause star formation. So we have this uh, gas and dust moving around the galaxy. The density wave theory says that gas and dust, as it moves around, slows down when it hits an arm, when it hits a spiral arm, where the density is higher. There are more collisions, and the compression there causes new stars to form, these young O and B stars. The O and the B stars don't last long, so they tend to go through their whole life while they're still in the spiral arm. A star like the Sun, or a star less massive than the Sun, lives a long time, and as this material moves, continues to orbit the center of the galaxy, it finds itself outside the spiral arm while it's still a star. So the O and the B stars are, are best tracers. They live their lives in the spiral arms. The older stars are not so good at tracing out the spiral arm because they uh, live long and they continue to move around the center of the galaxy. They move out of the high density concentration. But density wave theory we have material piling into the existing spiral arm structure and causing formation of uh, new stars. So that's the theory of how this the spiral structure survives. Fresh material piling into the existing spiral arm uh, keeps this uh, structure in place. So stellar populations, some more data about galaxies, about spiral galaxies. So we have stellar populations to talk about here. The population one type stars are more recently formed, have formed in the recent past. They are younger than the second population, population two. So population one are the young stars. They're found in the disk of our galaxy, in the plane of our galaxy. Uh, the sun is a population one type star. In these stars, there tends to be a higher concentration of the heavier atoms compared to the population two. And astronomers have a, a sort of a convention. An, an atom is called a metal if it's not hydrogen or helium. So that's everything else in the periodic table. So it's not metal in the traditional sense that conducts electricity, um, but just being more massive than helium. So carbon is a metal, oxygen is a metal, nitrogen is a metal. Uh, for the terminology that astronomers use. It's just a convenient uh, way of collecting all the elements uh, that are more massive than helium. So in the population one stars, these stars that are more recently formed, you find one to three percent of the uh, material in the star are the metals. If we And the another thing about the population one, they are in the plane of the galaxy where the spiral arms are located. Population two stars, these are found in not restricted to the plane of the galaxy. They're found in what's called the halo, a big spherical distribution around the center of the Milky Way galaxy. And they are poor in metals. They are primarily just hydrogen and helium, so only 0.1% or less. So that's sort of an estimate number. But they are much less, have, have much less of the heavy elements compared to the population one stars. Population two is older. Population 1 is younger. Population 1 has a lot of uh, enrichment of its uh, mixture of atoms with uh, elements heavier than helium. Population 2 is not enriched. It's more just the original hydrogen helium. Well, before I go on, how did the population 1 stars come to have enrichment of the metals? How did the population 1 stars come to have more nitrogen, oxygen, copper, gold, than the population two stars. 
then you should be saying that the population one stars have formed out of gas clouds that have debris in them from supernova explosions from uh, earlier generations that uh, processed the nuclear fuel and through nucleosynthesis created the elements up through iron in the cores of the massive stars and created the elements heavier than iron in the supernova explosions. The population one more recently formed more material that's not hydrogen helium. Population two more original stars to the galaxy older stars and uh, not very much contamination with uh, elements uh, more heavy than helium. So population one in the disk of the galaxy, population two in a spherical distribution around the center of the galaxy. Well, here's a little chart of uh, abundance of the elements for a population one star that's been enriched. Again, iron is here, and then elements uh, more massive than iron going out through. This is not a linear scale, so don't be misled. This is a logarithmic scale. So each uh, position here is 10 times less abundant. Uh, as you go down the uh, the list of numbers. So hydrogen helium for all stars are the dominant uh, elements, but for the population one stars there's a good uh, good you know less than three percent one to three percent mixture of the heavier elements. The population two star almost all hydrogen helium almost all hydrogen helium and these stars can be identified from their spectra they're missing the absorption lines due to carbon or oxygen or nitrogen or iron uh, etc um, the population two stars more just pure hydrogen and helium star clusters another fact about our galaxy is that there are two types of star clusters what's called the open clusters or sometimes called the galactic clusters these have uh, relatively low counts for the number of stars, a few thousand, a few hundred, and the gravity that between these stars is not enough to keep them from spreading out. They have kind of random motions in the cluster and gradually over time the cluster disperses and the stars leave a more concentrated region from where the gas cloud was that they formed from and they spread out and no longer can be recognized as a cluster. These open clusters are found in the plane of the Milky Way galaxy and again they are consisting of the young stars and I just noticed something here that uh, I might want to take a look at what's wrong on this uh, on this uh, slide if we come back here the population one are the younger stars and somehow when I was typing I have population two here so please uh, strike that out I don't know if I can uh, call up my little pointer here but I'm going to try to do that and uh, make a little mark on here. Uh, the population one stars are the stars that are young. The population two stars are the stars that are older. So just a little quick fix on the fly here. And now let's uh, get back to our, our presentation. Um, So, and it, we lost the annotation here, but uh, the population one stars are the young stars. The globular clusters, uh, up to a million stars in the cluster, they're found again in the halo in the spherical distribution around the center of the Milky Way galaxy, and they are made up of old stars. Population two, the old stars. I apologize for the, uh, the mistypo on that. Um, Let's move on. Open cluster here, the Pleiades, the Pleiades in the constellation of Taurus. And we have reflection nebula, the dust that's around these uh, bluish stars reflects the blue light of the stars, uh, scatters blue light. And we have a uh, young cluster here, open cluster, galactic cluster in the plane of the Milky Way galaxy. An example of a globular cluster, more stars and more tightly packed. And you can uh, pick out reddish stars here, older stars easily, and you can't count all the stars that are that are present here in the globular clusters. So, hope I didn't generate new questions here, but uh, you ought to be thinking about spiral arms. Uh, there's a, a theory on why they persist. The density wave theory is fresh gas and dust encounters a higher density region. It uh, piles in, compresses, forms stars, and we get a, a survival of the spiral arm pattern. 
Again, the population one stars, these are the younger stars, the sun falls in the population one. The population two stars are the older stars in the uh, spherical distribution, population one and the disk of our galaxy. And then open clusters and globular clusters, open clusters are young, they're in the plane of the Milky Way galaxy, they have uh, you know, a thousand stars or so. The globular clusters have 100,000 to a million stars, and they're older stars, they are the population two stars, the older stars, and they are in a spherical distribution around the center of the Milky Way. And that's where I'm going to uh, stop and uh, read your textbook about population and population two. Sorry if I misled you a little bit.